Hello everyone, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be tackling a practice problem set that relates to our lecture on work and energy. Let's go ahead and get started with problem number one. Problem number one says a weightlifter lifts a 275 kilogram barbell from the ground to a height of 2.4 meters. How much work has the weightlifter done in lifting the barbell and how much work is required to hold the weight at that height? Now work is defined in physics as the transfer of energy when a force is applied to an object causing displacement. Mathematically, work is equal to the dot product between force and displacement, and this expands into force multiplied by displacement multiplied by cosine theta, where theta is the angle between the force and the direction of displacement. Now, since the barbell is lifted vertically, the force exerted by the weightlifter is directly upward, so it is parallel to the displacement, and that makes theta equal to zero degrees. Cosine of zero degrees is equal to one, so we can actually simplify this equation to just force multiplied by displacement. Now the force exerted by the weightlifter, this is gonna be equal to the weight of the barbell, which is the gravitational force acting on it. So that means that we can expand this force term to be equal to mass multiplied by acceleration, specifically acceleration due to gravity. This is just Newton's second law here, and that's multiplied by displacement. Now we have all three of these variables, so we can go ahead and start to plug numbers into this equation and solve. The mass of the barbell is 275 kilograms. The acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, and the displacement is 2.4 meters. Now we're gonna make some approximations here to make the math a little bit easier. I'm gonna round 275 to 280. I'm gonna multiply it by the acceleration due to gravity, which I'm gonna round to 10. And then I'm gonna round 2.4 to 2.5. Now I'm gonna carry out this calculation first. 280 multiplied by 10. That gives us 2,800. And this is multiplied by 2.5. Now I can write this expression in a different way that might actually make the calculation a little bit easier. We're multiplying 2,800 by 2.5. So this is essentially 2,800 plus 2,800 plus 2,800 divided by 2. All right, so this is what it means when you take 2,800 and multiply it by 2.5. So 2,800 plus 2,800, that's 5,600. And then 2,800 divided by two, that's equal to 1,400. 5,600 plus 1,400, this is equal to 7,000 joules. So the work that is done when the weightlifter lifts the barbell, that's gonna be approximately 7,000 joules. So that's the first part of the question. The next part of the question is, well, how much work is required to hold the weight at that height? Now, using our understanding of work, we know that there's a relationship between force and displacement to work. When the barbell is held stationary at that height of 2.4 meters, no displacement occurs. And since work depends on both force and displacement, and there is no displacement when holding the barbell because the barbell is not moving, then the work done is zero. In other words, even though the weightlifter is applying a force to keep the barbell in position, no work is done because the barbell is not moving. So work is equal to force multiplied by displacement, but displacement is equal to zero. So work is equal to zero. 
So for the first part of the question, how much work has the weightlifter done in lifting the barbell? The answer is going to be approximately 7,000 joules. And for the second part, how much work is required to hold the weight at that height? That is zero joules. And the answer that best relates to those two values we calculated is going to be answer choice C. So problem number one is C. Let's move on to problem number two. Problem two says, a tractor pulls a log with a mass of 500 kilograms along the ground for 100 meters. The rope between the tractor and the log makes an angle of 30 degrees with the ground, and it is acted on by a tensile force of 5,000 newtons. How much work does the tractor perform in this scenario? And we're given a little bit of information here, the value for sine 30 degrees, cosine 30 degrees, and tangent 30 degrees. Now, in the previous example, we defined work. We said work is the transfer of energy when a force is applied to an object, causing it to move. Mathematically, work is the dot product between force and displacement, and this can be written as force multiplied by displacement multiplied by cosine theta. Now, we're given a lot of really good information in this problem. We're told that the force applied by the tractor is the tension in the rope, and that's equal to 5,000 newtons. We're told that the displacement is 100 meters and that the angle theta is equal to 30 degrees between the force and the direction of motion. So technically, we have all the information we need to just go ahead and plug these values into this equation. Now, as a side note, in the first problem we did, we didn't have force. So we replaced force with mass times acceleration because we know this from Newton's second law. But here we're given force, so we don't have to do that step. Even if you were to do that step, you know that the mass is 500 kilograms and you can approximate the acceleration due to gravity to 10 meters per second squared and you would still get 5,000. So let's go ahead and plug these values in. 5,000 newtons multiplied by 100 meters multiplied by cosine 30 and cosine 30 is equal to 0.866. Now I'm going to do a little bit of approximation so that this calculation is a little bit easier without a calculator. I'm going to approximate this to 0 0.9 and then 100 multiplied by 0 0.9, that's equal to 90. 90 multiplied by 5,000 is a really easy calculation. 9 times 5 is 45 and then we want to go ahead and add in all our zeros. We have a total of four zeros. One, two, three, four. So our answer here is that the work is equal to 450,000 joules, which is equal to 450 kilojoules. And the reason we want to convert it to kilojoules is because all our answer choices are in units of kilojoules. And the answer that's closest to 450 is answer choice C. So problem two is C. Wonderful, let's tackle problem three next. Problem three says a 2000 kilogram experimental car can accelerate from zero to 30 meters per second in six seconds. What is the average power of the engine needed to achieve this acceleration? Now, power is defined as the rate at which work is done. In other words, the rate at which energy is transferred or transformed. Mathematically, power is equal to work divided by time. To find the power, we need to calculate the work done by the engine in accelerating the car. Now, since the car is accelerating, the work done is converted into kinetic energy. And the formula for kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared, where m is the mass of the car, 2,000 kilograms, and v is the final velocity of the car, which is 30 meters per second. 
we can go ahead and plug these values into this equation and we get one half multiplied by 2000 kilograms multiplied by 30 meters per second and this is all squared. Now one half times 2000 that is equal to 1000 and then 30 squared that's equal to 900 and we have to make sure that we square those units as well. So now we have 1000 multiplied by 900. 1 times 9 is 9 and then we want to add in all of our zeros. We have a total of 5 zeros. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is equal to 900,000 kilograms times meters squared divided by second squared. So in other words, this is equal to 900,000 joules. This is going to be our numerator in our power equation. Now that we know that the work done is 900,000 joules, we can calculate the power using the time interval of six seconds. So this is gonna be 900,000 joules divided by six seconds. And this is going to be equal to 150,000 watts, because that is the units for power. Now, looking at our answer choices, A is 150 watts, B is 150 kilowatts, C is 900 watts, and D is 900 kilowatts. Now, we just calculated it was 150,000 watts. If we were to convert this to units of kilowatts, that would be equal to 150 kilowatts. We just divide by 1,000 to go from watts to kilowatts, and that aligns with answer choice B. So the correct answer to problem three is B. Moving on to problem four. Problem four says a 40 kilogram block is resting at a height of five meters off the ground. If the block is released and falls to the ground, which of the following is closest to its total mechanical energy at a height of two meters assuming negligible air resistance. Now the total mechanical energy, this is equal to the sum of the object's potential energy and kinetic energy. Now assuming negligible air resistance, conservation of energy states that the total mechanical energy of the block is constant as it falls. So here we have our 40 kilogram block. It is five meters off the ground. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna drop this block. And we wanna calculate the total mechanical energy when the block is two meters off the ground. Now again, I wanna restate that the total mechanical energy, it's going to remain constant throughout the trajectory of the fall if no external forces such as air resistance acts on it. And we're told that air resistance is negligible. So in other words, the total mechanical energy is going to be constant. That means that the total mechanical energy at five meters above the ground should be equal to the total mechanical energy we would calculate when the block is two meters off the ground. So then this problem becomes a problem of strategy. What is the best time in this fall to calculate total mechanical energy? That would be right before the block begins to fall. Why? Because at this point, the total mechanical energy is simply equal to potential energy. There's no kinetic energy because the block hasn't yet moved. And so this is really easy to calculate because potential energy is equal to mgh. m is the mass of the block, which we know is 40 kilograms. g is the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared, and h is the height above the ground, which is 5 meters. So we can go ahead and plug those val values into our equation. And here we can do a little bit of approximation to make the math easier. We're gonna approximate 9.8 meters per second squared to 10. 
So now we have 40 times 10 times 5. 10 times 5 is 50. 50 times 40, this is really easy. 5 times 4 is 20. And then we add in our two zeros. So the total mechanical energy of the block right before it starts to fall is 2,000 joules. And again, assuming negligible air resistance, the conservation of energy states that the total mechanical energy of the block is constant as it falls. So our total mechanical energy, when the block is two meters off the ground, this is going to be equal to 2,000 joules. So the correct answer for problem four is D. Fantastic. Let's tackle problem five next. Problem five says five cubic meters of a gas are brought from an initial pressure of one kilopascal to a pressure of three kilopascals through an isochoric process. During this process, the work performed by the gas is blank. Now, an isochoric process is one in which the volume of the system remains constant. This is something we go into in a little bit more detail in Chapter 3 when we cover thermodynamics. An isochoric process, again, is one in which the volume remains constant. This means that during this process, the gas, it doesn't expand or compress. Work in the context of thermodynamics, it's often calculated as pressure multiplied by delta V, where delta V is the change in volume. However, we just said that in an isochoric process, delta V is equal to zero because the volume doesn't change. Therefore, work is equal to pressure multiplied by a delta V that's equal to zero, and so work is equal to zero joules. No work is done in an isochoric process because there is no change in volume regardless of the change in pressure. The gas, it does not perform any work on the surroundings, nor does the surroundings perform any work on the gas. So the correct answer is C. Let's move on to problem six. Problem six says, in the pulley system shown below, which of the following is closest to the tension force in each rope if the mass of the object is 10 kilograms and the object is accelerating upwards at two meters per second squared? Now, the first step is to identify the forces acting on the object. And the object has two forces acting on it. That first force is the gravitational force, which is pulling it downward, and it can be calculated as mass multiplied by acceleration, specifically acceleration due to gravity. We actually have both of these quantities, so we can go ahead and plug them in and calculate the gravitational force. The mass is 10 kilograms, and the acceleration due to gravity can be approximated as 10 meters per second squared. That means that our gravitational force is equal to 10 times 10, which is 100 newtons. Now the second force that's acting on our object is the tension force in the ropes pulling the object. And this is really important to understand and to be able to look at the pulley system shown and decipher what this actually means. So looking at this diagram, you notice that there are actually two tension forces pulling the mass up. And it's important for us to recognize this because the net force that's acting on this object, it's going to be the difference between the upward tension force and the downward gravitational force. So our F net is going to be equal to 2T because we just said that there are two tension forces pulling the mass up minus that gravitational force. Now we're ultimately trying to figure out what T is. What is that tension force in each rope? And we can calculate the gravitational force. We just did 100 Newtons, and we can actually also calculate the net force. We're given all the right information to do that. 
So we can rearrange this equation to solve for t. 2t is going to be equal to f net plus f gravitational. And we can make this even more correct by dividing both sides by 2. So the tension force in each rope is going to be equal to the net force plus the gravitational force divided by 2. Now we have the gravitational force, but we haven't calculated the net force yet. To calculate the net force, we're going to be using Newton's second law. Newton's second law states that the net force acting on an object is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by its acceleration. And we have both of those quantities. Mass is 10 kilograms. Acceleration is 2 meters per second squared. And that gives us a net force equal to 20 newtons. So now we can go ahead and plug it into this equation. F net is 20. The gravitational force is equal to 100 newtons. And this is all going to be divided by 2. 20 plus 100 is 120 newtons divided by 2. This gives us a tension force that's equal to 60 newtons. So the tension force in each rope here is equal to 60 newtons, and that best matches answer choice B. So 6 is B. Let's tackle problem 7 next. Problem 7 says, which of the following is a conservative force? So really quickly, I want to refresh on the difference between conservative and non-conservative forces. A conservative force is a force that does not dissipate energy. So in a system where only conservative forces are acting, the total mechanical energy, which is the sum of potential and kinetic energy, it remains constant. Now, work done by a conservative force, it depends only on the initial and final positions and not on the path taken. This means that when an object moves in a closed loop, returning to its starting point, the net work done by a conservative force is equal to zero. Examples of conservative forces include gravity, electrostatic forces, and spring forces. On the other hand, non-conservative forces, they dissipate energy, usually in the form of heat, and the total mechanical energy of the system will decrease over time. Now let's go ahead and work through each of our options. A says air resistance. Air resistance is a non-conservative force. It opposes the motion of objects moving through air, converting some of the mechanical energy into heat, thus reducing the total mechanical energy over time. And the work done by air resistance depends on the path taken by the object. Now, we're looking for conservative forces. Air resistance is non-conservative, so that is not the correct answer. B says friction. Friction is also a non-conservative force. So like air resistance, it converts mechanical energy into heat as it opposes motion. And the work done by friction depends on the path traveled, and it causes a loss of mechanical energy in the system. So B is also not the correct answer. C says gravity. Now gravity, this is a classic example of a conservative force. The work done by gravity only depends on the initial and final positions of the object, not on the path taken. So when an object moves in a gravitational field, the mechanical energy is conserved as long as no non-conservative forces act on the system. C is actually the correct answer, but we're also going to look at D. D says convection. Convection is not a force in the classical sense, but rather a mechanism of heat transfer in fluids. It involves the bulk movement of fluid due to a temperature gradient, and it's not associated with the type of force that can be classified as conservative. So that is also not the correct answer. Therefore, the final answer for problem seven, it's going to be C. The only conservative force among these options is gravity. So seven is C. Let's move on to problem eight. 
Eight says, during uniform circular motion, which of the following relationships is necessarily true? So let's work through each of these options. But first, I just want to remind you that uniform circular motion refers to an object moving in a circular path with constant speed. Even though the speed is constant, the object's velocity is not constant because remember, velocity is a vector that depends on both speed and direction. In uniform circular motion, the direction of the velocity is always changing because the object is continuously changing direction as it moves around the circle. Now, the force responsible for keeping the object in circular motion is called the centripetal force, which always acts towards the center of the circle. Most importantly, this force does not change the speed of the object. It only changes the direction of the velocity. So keep that information in mind as we work through these options. Answer choice A says no work is done. This statement is true in uniform circular motion. Remember, work is defined as the dot product between force and displacement. That expands to force multiplied by displacement multiplied by cosine theta, where theta is the angle between the force and the direction of displacement. Now, in uniform circular motion, the centripetal force acts perpendicular to the displacement at all times. Since the force is directed towards the circle, all right, the force is directed towards the center of the circle and the displacement is tangent to the circle. Since the angle between the force and displacement is 90 degrees, cosine 90 degrees is going to be equal to zero, meaning that work, which is equal to force times displacement times cosine theta, is also going to be equal to zero. So no work is done by the centripetal force. And actually the correct answer for problem eight is A. Now don't worry, we're still gonna go through the other options as well. Option B says the centripetal force does work. So this is the complete opposite of A. And we just figured out that that's false because as discussed, the centripetal force acts perpendicular to the direction of displacement, and since work requires a component of the force to act in the direction of displacement, no work is done by the centripetal force in this case. So B is incorrect. What about C? C says that the velocity does work. This statement is also false. Velocity is a vector that describes the speed and direction of motion. It is not a force. Work is done by forces, not by velocity. So the statement is incorrect. Then option D says, potential energy depends on position of the object around the circle. Now the statement is false in the context of uniform circular motion. In the absence of other forces like gravity or changes in height, potential energy does not change as the object moves around the circle. The mechanical energy remains constant as long as there is no external work being done and no external forces like gravity are acting in such a way that could affect potential energy. In uniform circular motion, the object's position around the circle doesn't affect its potential energy unless there is a vertical component, which this question does not specify. So considering all that, the correct answer for problem eight is going to be A. Let's tackle problem nine next. Problem nine says, which of the following best characterizes the work energy theorem? Now the work energy theorem states that the net work done on an object is equal to the change in its kinetic energy. So mathematically, we can write this as change in kinetic energy, which is equal to one half mv final squared minus one half mv initial squared, where m is mass, vf is the final velocity, vi is the initial velocity. This theorem essentially tells us that when work is done on an object, its kinetic energy changes as a result. So let's keep this in mind as we work through each answer choice. Answer choice A says, the work done by any force is proportional only to the magnitude of that force. 
Now, this statement is incorrect because the work done by a force depends not only on the magnitude of the force, but also on the displacement of the object and the angle between the force and the direction of displacement. Remember, work is calculated as force multiplied by displacement multiplied by cosine theta. So A is incorrect. Let's do B. B says, the total work done on any object is equal to the change in kinetic energy for that object. Now, this statement is correct. It directly describes the work energy theorem. The total or net work done by an object is indeed equal to the change in its kinetic energy. And actually, B is the correct answer, but we're still going to go through C and D. C says the work done on an object by any force is proportional to the change in kinetic energy for that object. Now, this statement is incorrect. While the total work done on an object is equal to the change in its kinetic energy, there is no proportional relationship between work and kinetic energy. The network equals the change in kinetic energy, not a proportional amount. So it's very careful to pay attention to the wording for problems that kind of test concepts in this manner. So C is incorrect. D says the work done by an applied force on an object is equal to the change in kinetic energy of that object. Now this statement is also incorrect because it implies that only the applied force contributes to the change in kinetic energy. However, in reality, the work energy theorem considers the network, which could include the contributions of all of the forces acting on the object, not just an applied force. Other forces such as friction or gravity, they can also affect the total work done and thus the kinetic energy. So now that we've gone through all of the answer choices, again, we can confidently say that the correct answer for problem nine is going to be answer choice B. Moving on to problem 10. Problem 10 says, a massless spring initially compressed by a displacement of two centimeters is now compressed by four centimeters. How has the potential energy of this system changed? Now the potential energy stored in a compressed or stretched spring is given by Hooke's law for elastic potential energy. The formula for the potential energy in a spring is equal to one half kx squared, where k is the spring constant. This is a measure of the stiffness of the spring. And x is the displacement of the spring from its equilibrium position. Now from this equation, we can see that the potential energy of the spring is proportional to the square of the displacement. This means that if the displacement is doubled, the potential energy does not simply double. Instead, it increases by a factor of the square of the change in displacement. So let's say for our potential energy, when the displacement was two centimeters, this is gonna be proportional to the displacement squared, two squared. But what if the displacement, ignore that, what if the displacement was four centimeters? then the potential energy would be proportional to four squared. Let's look at this more closely. Two squared is equal to four. Four squared is equal to 16. Going from a displacement of two centimeters to a displacement of four centimeters results in your potential energy quadrupling. And so the correct answer for 10 here is that increasing the displacement by a factor of two increases the potential energy by a factor of four. So the potential energy has quadrupled, and the correct answer is D. Let's tackle example 11. This problem says Josh, who has a mass of 80 kilograms, and Sarah, who has a mass of 50 kilograms, jump off a 20-meter tall building and land on a fire net. The net compresses and they bounce back up at the same time. Which of the following statements is not true? Now, when Josh and Sarah jump from the building, they start with gravitational potential energy at the top due to their height. Then as they fall, 
the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy as their speed increases. Now, just as a friendly reminder, the relationship between potential energy and height is given by this equation, mgh, where m is mass, g is the acceleration due to gravity, and h is height. Now, we can calculate this for Sarah and Josh because we're given all the information we need to plug into this equation. Now, when they reach the net, all that potential energy has been converted to kinetic energy. And the equation for kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared. Then upon impact with the net, the kinetic energy is then stored as elastic potential energy as the net compresses. And then finally, when the net recoils, this elastic potential energy is converted back into kinetic energy, causing them to bounce back up. So keep that process in mind as we evaluate each statement. Statement A says, Sarah will bounce higher than Josh. This statement is not true. The height to which they bounce back depends on the amount of energy stored in the net, which is related to the energy they brought into the system. Since both Josh and Anna jumped from the same height, their initial potential energy is different due to their different masses. Josh, having more mass, had more potential energy at the start, and thus more energy is stored in the net for him. Therefore, Josh should bounce higher than Sarah, assuming energy losses are minimal and they are both rebounding with the same efficiency. So this makes A the correct answer to this question because it's the statement that is not true. But we're going to work through B, C, and D as well. All right, so A is the correct answer. It's the statement that is not true. B, C, and D are all true statements. B says, for Josh, the change in speed from the start of the jump to contacting the net is 20 meters per second. Now we can verify this by using the equation for velocity after falling from a certain height under the influence of gravity. That's equal to velocity square root is equal to velocity is equal to square root of two multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity multiplied by height. And we know all these variables so we can plug them in. Two times gravity, we're gonna approximate this to 10 meters per second squared. And then this is multiplied by height, which is 20 meters. So now we have 2 times 10, which is 20. 20 times 20 is 400. Square root of 400, this is going to be equal to 20 meters per second. So this is approximately 20 meters per second. So the answer choice B is a true statement. What about C? C says Josh will experience a greater force upon impact than Sarah. This statement is true. The force experienced during the impact depends on the mass and the change in velocity. Since Josh has a greater mass than Sarah, the momentum he carries into the net is larger. And therefore, this answer choice is a true statement. All right, Josh's greater momentum leads to a greater force during impact, assuming the same stopping time in the net. And now what about answer choice D? D says the energy in this event is converted from potential to kinetic to elastic to kinetic. And this statement is true. It accurately describes the energy conversions happening in this event. So again, as Josh and Anna fall, gravitational potential energy converts to kinetic energy. Then upon impact with the net, the kinetic energy is stored as elastic potential energy. And then as they bounce back up, this energy converts back to kinetic energy. All right, so statements B, C, and D are all true and correct. A is the only statement that is false. And since this problem wants us to choose the statement that is not true, the correct answer for 11 is A. Problem 12 is next. Problem 12 says a parachutist jumps from a plane. <laughs> LOL, do they mean skydiver? <laughs> anyway, beginning at the point when the jumper reaches terminal velocity, this is constant velocity during freefall, which of the following statements is slash are true? 
Statement one says the jumper is in translational equilibrium. Statement two says the jumper is not being acted upon by any forces. And statement three says there is an equal amount of work being done by gravity and air resistance. Now, at terminal velocity, the force of gravity and the force of air resistance are equal in magnitude, leading to translational equilibrium. So statement one is true. Now, if these forces have the same magnitude and they act over the same displacement, then the work performed is the same as well. And that makes statement three true as well. What about statement two? The jumper is not being acted upon by any forces. Even though the net force is equal to zero, there are still forces acting on the skydiver. And so statement two is actually false. Only statement one and three are true. And so the correct answer for problem 12 is going to be B. Problem 13 says mechanical advantage and efficiency are both ratios. Which of the following is true regarding the quantities used in these ratios? Mechanical advantage is a measure of how much a machine multiplies the input force to perform a task. So it compares the output force exerted by the machine to the input force applied to the machine. The formula for mechanical advantage is equal to output force divided by input force. Now output force is the force the machine exerts on the load Input force is the force exerted by the user or applied to the machine. So in short, mechanical advantage is a ratio of forces, and it tells us how much easier a machine makes a task by comparing the force needed without the machine to the force required with the machine. Now, efficiency. This is a measure of how effectively a machine converts input energy or work into useful output energy or work. It compares the useful output work to the input work, and it's usually expressed as a percentage. So it is output work divided by input work multiplied by 100%. Output work is the useful work performed by the machine. Input work is the total work or energy supplied to the machine. So in short, efficiency is a ratio of work or energy. Now, a machine with 100% efficiency would convert all of the input work into useful output work, but unfortunately, in reality, some energy is going to be lost due to friction, heat, or any other factor. Now, with that out of the way, let's start analyzing each of our options. A says mechanical advantage compares values of work. Efficiency compares values of power. This statement is incorrect. Mechanical advantage compares forces, not work, and efficiency compares work or energy, not power. Though power can sometimes be related to efficiency in other contexts. Nevertheless, A is incorrect. What about B? B says mechanical advantage compares values of forces, efficiency compares values of work. This statement is correct. Mechanical advantage is the ratio of output force to input force, and efficiency is the ratio of output work to input work. So this answer choice is absolutely correct, and it's the right answer for this problem. But let's go through C and D anyway. C says mechanical advantage compares values of work, efficiency compares values of energy, incorrect because mechanical advantage compares forces, not power. But the second part is true. Efficiency does compare values of energy or work. So this is half true, but not the correct answer. We want a full truth. D says mechanical advantage compares values of work. Efficiency compares values of forces. This statement is also incorrect. They have it mixed up here. Mechanical advantage compares forces. Efficiency compares work or energy. So again, the correct answer for 13 is going to be B. Moving on to problem 14. 
Problem 14 says if the gravitational potential energy of an object has doubled in the absence of non-conservative forces, which of the following must be true, assuming the total mechanical energy of the object is constant? Now, the total mechanical energy of an object, this is equal to the sum of the kinetic energy of the object and the potential energy of the object. Now, since we're told that the total mechanical energy is constant, any increase in potential energy must be offset by an equal decrease in kinetic energy, and vice versa. If potential energy is decreased, that has to be offset by an e equal increase in kinetic energy. Now, this idea, it best aligns with answer choice C, which is actually the correct answer for problem 14. But let's also discuss why the other answer choices are not correct. Now, we said in the absence of non-conservative forces, all changes in potential energy must be met by an equal change in kinetic energy. Please note that it is the difference in potential energy that is the same as the difference in kinetic energy, not the proportionality. So this allows us to eliminate answer choice B. What about A and D? So this is interesting. Both A and D could be true statements, but they don't necessarily have to be, right? The object's mass could have been quadrupled while its height could have been cut in half. We're looking for a statement that must be true, and A and D don't have to be true, but C does. The kinetic energy has decreased by the same quantity as the potential energy has increased, and vice versa. That must be true in regards to our problem. So the correct answer for 14 is going to be C. Now let's do our last and final problem for this lecture. Problem 15 says a consumer is comparing two new cars. Car A exerts 250 horsepower, while car B exerts 300 horsepower. The consumer is most concerned about the peak velocity that the car can reach. If non-conservative forces can be ignored, which of these statements is correct? Now let's just start by defining a couple of things. Horsepower is a unit of power, and power is the rate at which energy is transferred or work is done. It's defined as work divided by time. Now in this problem, the power of the cars is given in horsepower. We're also given this conversion. One horsepower is equal to 745.7 watts. Okay, let's keep this in mind. Then the next thing we want to talk about is the peak velocity. The peak velocity of a car depends on how much energy is transferred into kinetic energy as the car moves. And remember that kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. The total energy transferred into kinetic energy, it depends on the car's power, but peak velocity depends primarily on the car's ability to convert power into motion efficiently, and ultimately on the relationship between force and velocity. If we ignore non-conservative forces like friction or air resistance, the car's maximum velocity is theoretically unlimited. However, higher power means more work is done in less time, allowing the car to accelerate faster. So let's keep those concepts in mind. Let's work through our answer choices. A says car A and car B both have unlimited velocities. Now this statement is theoretically true if we ignore non-conservative forces, all right? In the absence of friction and air resistance, there is no upper limit to the speed that either car can reach over time. And it's actually a true statement here. So A is the correct answer, but we wanna work through the other answer choices as well. Answer choice B says car A will reach its peak velocity more quickly than car B. This statement is false. Car B has more horsepower, 300 horsepower, than car A, which only has 250 horsepower. This means that car B can do more work in less time. Therefore, car B will accelerate faster and reach any given velocity more quickly than car A. 
So answer choice B is incorrect. Answer choice C says car A will dissipate less energy to the surroundings than car B. This statement is really not related to the information provided. Dissipation of energy to the surroundings typically refers to losses due to friction or heat, which are not mentioned in the problem, and no indication is given about either car dissipating energy differently. So answer choice C is just incorrect and unrelated. Answer choice D says car A will have a lower peak velocity than car B. Now, this statement is false based on the problem setup. Since non-conservative forces are ignored, there is no limit to the velocity that either car can reach over time. Therefore, car A will not have a lower peak velocity than car B, even though car B has more power and will accelerate faster. So that answer choice is also incorrect. So with what we have here, the correct answer is going to be answer choice A. Car A and car B will both have unlimited velocities. And with that, we've completed this practice problem set. I really hope that this was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below, or feel free to shoot me an email. I love replying to emails. Some days are better than others, of course, but do reach out and do not be afraid to double email me, okay? No shame there. So feel free to reach out if you need any help. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.